a diary, a butcher's knife, and a children's book titled Daddy Kisses under the bed of a 13-year-old missing girl. This is the story of Rachel Marie Skemp. Right, mate. Oi, governor. Oh, I haven't told you my new favorite joke. No. <laughs> no. Oh my god. Okay. It's like my proudest moment, like my greatest creation. What did the redneck say when Edgar Allan Poe stole his corn? What? Macabre! <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> the goths from the south will love that shit. <laughs> but I, you have to do like a redneck like Macabre. <laughs> <laughs> 10 out of 10. Except, no, you're the only person to give me 10 out of 10. Everyone else just rolls their eyes and is like, that is a terrible joke. And I'm like, I thought it was funny. Chef's kiss. The anatomy of a perfect joke. Yeah, I thought of another one too, like a few months back, but it, it wasn't as funny. But it, let me see if I can remember it. What do you call that strap on the back of your bra? I don't know. A jug band. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one too? Yes. <laughs> I am just I'm trying to get into, I'm trying to understand what mindset you have to be to to think of jokes like that. Just my normal, just my normal mindset. Apparently. <laughs> Mostly what it is is I well, for both of those, it's the exact same process, which is that you hear a funny word, like the word macabre, mm -hmm. and the word the phrase jug band are both really weird and funny. So you start with the weird word and that's your punchline. And then you work backwards and think, how do I get to the punchline? Now explain to me, where did you come up with the word jug band? Well, it's a real <laughs> phrase. What is it? I've never it's, heard it before. Yes, you have. No. A jug band is a band, like a musical band, but mm -hmm. it's when the Appalachians, like the hill folk down in the south, they're too poor to afford real instruments, so they just have whiskey jugs that they, they blow into. In them? Oh my god. Yeah. That's a jug band because you're blowing into a jug. Okay, so I knew what that was. I didn't know it was called that. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> so you just thought it was funny that I was referring to yeah. a brass strap as a jug band? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I am a simple creature, Hannah. <laughs> You make boob you just jokes like the word and I jokes. will laugh. Yes. <laughs> you just like dirty words. Yes. I'm glad we came to this conclusion together because <laughs> you say boobs, I say where? <laughs> <laughs> boobs. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Crime Soup Podcast. I'm your host, Kaylee Carter. And I'm Hannah. A diary, a butcher's knife, and a children's book titled Daddy Kisses under the bed of a 13-year-old missing girl. This is the story of Rachel Marie Skemp. Rachel Marie was born on October 13th, 1982, to parents Amy and Jeff Skemp in Melrose Park, Illinois. Amy and Jeff divorced when Rachel was three. Jeff moved to Dallas, Texas, and Amy stayed in Illinois. Amy met and started dating a man named Vincent Mellon. They eventually got married and had two more children together, Jason in 1988 and Ashley in 1990. The family lived in Bolingbrook, Illinois at the time of the incident, about 30 miles outside of Chicago. There's evidence that Vincent had a hard time keeping a job, so Amy was the primary breadwinner. There's also evidence that Vincent was abusive to Amy, both before Rachel went missing and after. They moved around in Illinois a lot, apparently due to financial hardships. There are records of foreclosure complaints, forcible entry, and detainer complaints. This can mean that an occupant is refusing to leave a property even after being given notice or being evicted. Do you know what kind of abuse? It just says abuse, like physically? Yes, um, I, I will get into that right now, actually. So when Rachel was eight, her mother and stepfather got into an argument that escalated into Vincent hitting Amy and pushing her down the stairs, as well as making verbal threats on Amy's life. 
Amy filed a restraining order against Vincent and was granted one, but Amy dropped the order soon after and got back together with Vincent. That's the kind of abuse that I feel like doesn't happen in one day. Like that's that's not just an out of the blue type abusive thing to do. So this, he's probably been beating Amy, hitting Amy, verbally abusing Amy, probably like financially abusing Amy and, and leading up to pushing her down the stairs and threatening to kill her, right? And so. it also worries me, like I know this isn't always the case, but abusive men like this, whenever they get into relationships with people who have kids, what's the likelihood that he's not just abusing the mother, but he's also abusing their children? Exactly. 100%. Despite Rachel's turbulent home life, she was popular and had many friends. They all described her as the life of the party and the most beautiful girl in the room. She was an honor student at her middle school, which was the last school she attended. And Rachel was extremely beautiful. Like, we'll post some pictures of her. She, like, movie star pretty. In spring of 1995, when Rachel was 12, she left a note and ran away from home. She slept outside one of her friend's homes because she was scared to be blamed for something her younger siblings broke. She slept outside in the spring of Illinois. That would be freezing. So back to, this poor girl must have been dealing with a lot to be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And that also speaks to your... You saying that there was probably abuse going on, too, with, with her and her siblings. The next morning, she called her step-grandparents from that same friend's house who came and picked her up and took her home. She was gone for a total of 12 hours. Fast forward to a year later, on January 30th, 1996, Rachel's friends found her crying by her locker. Her friends were concerned and asked what was wrong. Rachel only told her friends, in quotes, she had a problem but that she would take care of it herself. So the day after this happened, on January 31st, 1996, Rachel stayed home from school because she had a sore throat, and her stepfather, Vincent Mellon, who was unemployed at the time, stayed home with her. At 10.45 a.m., Rachel called her paternal grandmother, Lucy Skemp, to thank her for the Christmas presents she had sent. Lucy said the phone call lasted about five minutes and nothing was out of the ordinary until Rachel got very quiet. Her grandmother asked, is he there? Referring to Vincent, and Rachel responded yes before telling her grandmother that she had to go. So right then and there, the vibes are off. I I mean, probably Lucy knows that Vincent has been physically abusive to Amy. And I'm sure Rachel has talked to her grandmother about some of the stuff that's been happening in her home. Maybe not all of it, but enough to know that Rachel feels unsafe with her stepfather. This is so sad because you know that Lucy, her grandmother, wants nothing more than for Vincent to be out of the picture. 100%. So the grandmother also also knows about the tension. So Rachel, Rachel has obviously talked to her about what's going on at home, or at least how she feels about Vincent, her stepfather. As far as we know, Lucy Skemp is the last person to talk to Rachel besides Vincent Mellon. Later that same day, six-year-old Ashley came home from school at 3.15 and went straight to her big sister's room to play. But Rachel wasn't there. Later that same day, six-year-old Ashley came home from school at 3.15 and went straight to her big sister's room to play, but Rachel wasn't there. Ashley immediately told Vincent, but he didn't do anything about it or call anyone, which, in my opinion, is so fucking suspicious. It's not like she went to school and has the potential to be in any other place. She stayed home sick, and he was just like, meh, she's not home. Red flag. How old is she? She's, what, 12? 13. 13, okay. Okay. So she, I mean, she's old enough that she could walk somewhere, right? Yes, but it was negative 20 degrees outside. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Amy, Rachel's mother, and Jason, who was eight at the time, arrived home after 5 p.m. When Ashley told her mom that Rachel wasn't home, Amy immediately called Bolingbrook police, but they didn't show up to the house until a few hours after the call. So in that time, between when Amy called the police and the police actually showed up, Amy was calling like all of Rachel's friends, the school, anyone that she knew who might have known where Rachel was and nobody had seen Rachel that day. Hours later? Mm -hmm. And when they got there, they were super, super like not worried about it. They, They treated Rachel's disappearance as a runaway situation since she had run away a year prior. So they didn't question anyone and they didn't conduct a search. They didn't look for her. It was 
a bitter cold day. It was negative 20 degrees outside. So even if this was a runaway situation, it was still a dangerous situation. Yeah, she's in danger. If yeah. she's in, have you ever been in negative 20 degree weather? No, and I don't want to. Your car <laughs> doesn't even start. No, no. <laughs> So yeah, I, I need somebody to walk me through how cold that actually is because my brain says, yes, that is so fucking cold. Like I can't even imagine. Like this is why ski masks exist. Like you literally have to cover all of your exposed skin. Otherwise it like starts to burn almost like a sunburn. It's called like wind burn. I don't even know how long you would even be able to survive. Yeah. So it's highly unlikely that she just left the house, right? Negative 20 degrees. Yeah. But so, yeah, it's extremely disappointing that the police didn't immediately do anything because this was a life and death situation. Like, even if she had just run away. Is there snow on the ground? I don't know. It doesn't say anything. If there was snow on the ground, that actually probably would have helped police because they would be able to maybe track her footprints or Uh something. But I don't I don't know. But if it's just negative 20 and dry outside... But also, okay, so then this begs the question, let's say that Vincent did do something with her. How is he functioning in negative 20 degree weather? Like, is he driving somewhere? Is he going outside? Like, how how would he even make her disappear? He has to go out in that weather. Fucking beats me. Uh, Vincent was the last person to see Rachel, and he told police that Rachel wasn't displaying any red flag behaviors. He recounts the day as follows. Rachel calls her grandmother at 10.45 a.m. Lucy Skemp corroborates this. Rachel and Vincent play Nintendo for about three hours after the call until Rachel decides to take a nap in her bed. Vincent claims the last time he saw her, she was curled up in a blue blanket on her bed asleep. At 2.30 p.m., Vincent takes their German Shepherd for a walk in negative 20 degree weather. He says he leaves the door unlocked during the walk. Vincent claims that his dog slipped out of its collar and chased a rabbit into a nearby field and got lost during the walk. He just decides to leave the dog, figuring that it can find its way home. Vincent says he returns home 30 minutes after he originally left. Okay, let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, did someone, did anyone see him walking the dog? Nobody saw him walking the dog. Okay. Um, but... Uh, Let me actually continue on before we talk about this. Okay. At 3.15 p.m., six-year-old Ashley gets home from school and Rachel's nowhere to be found. Sometime between 4.30 and 5 p.m., a local real estate broker, with the help of one of Mellon's neighbors, returns Vincent's dog after finding it wandering the neighborhood. None of the neighbors claim to have seen Vincent taking the dog on a walk, but a few of the neighbors did see the dog. Okay, you know what this sounds like? Hmm. It sounds like the Lacey Peterson case. You'll have to remind me how it's similar because I do not remember a lot of the Lacey Peterson case uh, details. So Lacey Peterson, she was eight months pregnant, right? This is in California. Mm -hmm. And her husband claims that he went somewhere. I think he went to go work on his boat or something like in his garage. So like he wasn't home. Mm -hmm. He claims that Lacey took the dog on a walk and that she must have been abducted sometime during her walk and their dog was found running loose in the neighborhood and it had its leash attached and Lacey wasn't anywhere to be found. Was it a small dog? I can't remember. Seems pretty brave to snatch a woman with her dog. Scott, her husband, eventually did get convicted for her murder Mm -hmm. and I guess the main theory is that he staged it to look like she had gone out to walk the dog that day, but really he had just attached the leash and then let the dog loose. And that is exactly what I, I personally think Vincent did. Is that a common thing? I, I don't know. Where do you, where did these guys come up with these? I I would never think to do this, but this shows planning, right? Yeah. I mean, in, in my, in my opinion, nobody can like prove that he did this though. Yeah. But it's also negative 20 degree (laughs) weather. Like he took it. I again, I've never been in negative 20 degree weather. Do people take their dogs on walks? Like I understand your dog needing to go outside to potty, but like a walk? Is that normal? According to weatherunderground.com on January 31st, 1996, um, most of the day it says that the actual temperature was zero degrees even. Oh, okay. That's cold, but not as cold as negative 20. Yeah, but there was wind. Oh, 
But I don't know how, how, I mean, it only says it's like, uh, so at the time he would have taken the dog for a walk, what time was that? Like, you said 2? 2? 2.30 is, was when he said he took the dog on a walk. Okay, at 2.30 p.m. it was zero degrees outside and there was a wind speed of 14 miles an hour. That's a lot of wind. Is it? Yeah. That's pretty windy. Okay, so the reason it probably said that it was negative 20 is because of wind chill, I imagine. Yeah, that makes sense. The day before, it was also, like, hovering around zero. Does it say anything about there being snow or... No precipitation. So it was around zero degrees with 14 mile an hour wind, probably creating a negative 20 degree wind chill, which sounds miserable and freezing. I'd be curious to know if they have a fenced in yard, because if you have a fenced in yard, it seems like on really cold days like this, what you would do, or at least what I would do is forego the walk and be like, since it's so cold, let's just let the dog out into the backyard to use the bathroom because I'm not taking him out on a walk. But I'm also just really lazy and I hate the cold. No, no, no. That That's, the, I feel like that's the thing that most dog owners would do if they had a fenced in yard. And I actually had their address at the time of this, but it was bulldozed down. The house that this happened in is no longer there. So I can't look it up to see what it looks like now. But I wonder if I can look up to see what it looked like then. Okay, so it's a house. With a yard. Yeah, it's a house with a yard. I don't know if it was fenced in at the time, but it's fenced in It's fenced in, in the pictures. The only other option is maybe he really enjoys negative 20 degree weather, in which case... The fuck? Double red, yeah. double red flag. Straight to jail. <laughs> this guy's obviously capable of murder. <laughs> Straight to prison. I bet he was one of those freaks who wears shorts in the wintertime. Ugh. No. It's, it's the white men who think they're like descendants of Vikings who have something to prove. And so they wear shorts and like wife beaters in, in the dead winter. I mean, I, I just don't, I cannot wrap my head around that actually being comfortable. So I think you have something to prove. That's, that's the logical thought process there. Wear a jacket, please. Your crusty elbows will thank you. Like, (laughs) (laughs) is elbow crust a thing? You've never seen a man with crusty elbows? I don't think I look at men's elbows. No. I don't think I do either, but sometimes... Do you know, like they just get dry? Yeah. Like, I think a man who doesn't wear a coat in the winter is more susceptible to dry crusty elbows because <laughs> just the freezing cold dries the shit out of your skin. And I know that man isn't putting on lotion. If you're not wearing a coat in the winter, you're not putting on lotion. I love how quickly we can jump to conclusions <laughs> about this man. It's like, we know his name and age, but we're like, you know, he's got crusty elbows. <laughs> no. You should be in profiling, Kaylee. You know everything about a person with very little information. If you see a picture of him, you'll think he has crusty elbows too. Oh, okay. You've seen a, I haven't seen a picture of him. <laughs> you look at him and you're like, I just know he wears size 11 shoes and he's got crusty elbows. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, damn. People who know him are like, How'd she do that? that? (laughs) (laughs) The people listening think we're joking, but we're not. I am very perceptive. (laughs) I know whether or not you have crusty elbows and whether or not you have mommy or daddy issues. Like when Kaylee worked for the police department, they didn't have canines. They had Kaylee. (laughs) Bork, bork, motherfucker. They'd like pull her out of the back of the truck (laughs) and she would walk out and just start sniffing you. (laughs) Okay, what what happens next? So, okay, hold on. Let me make sure I have this right. So if I remember correctly, so Rachel, she stays home from school because she's got a sore throat. Yeah. She calls her grandma about 10, 1045, and says, yeah, I'm here. He's here. According to Vincent, they play Nintendo for three hours, and then she goes in her room to lay down for a nap. Yep. And then her, oh, and then... Vincent claims that he took the dog on a walk, but then the dog ran after a rabbit and he said, Fuck to it. hell with it. The dog will just find his way home. So then her younger sister comes home after school about like 3.15. Yep. So sometime between talking to her grandmother at 10.45 and 3.15, because everything in between then is all based on Vincent's yeah, word. That's up in the air. It could be true, could be not. So if we're suspicious of him, then something happened to her between getting off the phone with her grandma and 3.15 when Ashley gets home from school and Rachel's nowhere to be found. Yep.
but again, after Ashley gets home, Rachel's nowhere to be found. She tells Vincent, Vincent's like, meh, whatever. And then sometime between 4.30 and 5, a local real estate broker uh, finds the dog and one of Mellon's neighbors directs him to Vincent Mellon's house. Where So that dog was theoretically out in the cold for like two or two and a half hours? Yeah. Amy calls Jeff, her ex-husband, Rachel's biological father, and tells him that Rachel's missing and he flies in from Dallas on the day that Amy calls him. After two full days, Rachel did not return home and the police just then started to suspect foul play. After two whole days. After the full two days, police and the FBI did decide to conduct searches for Rachel by means of helicopters, dogs, horses, dive teams, all-terrain vehicles, ground canvases, and thermal imaging. Nothing was found. Something that bothers me so much is that because police didn't take this seriously at first, whoever presumably is the cause of Rachel going missing had two full days to hide what they had done. Something also noted that I think is very important is that Vincent had fresh scratches all over both of his arms when police questioned him. Like when they were talking to them the day Amy reported Rachel missing. But Vincent told them the scratches were from working on his car. And I think it's crazy the police didn't press the issue about the scratches being potential defensive wounds on his arms. Like, this man had scratches up and down both of his arms. So he's not a suspect? They're not, like, arresting him or anything? No. Like, he was the one with her when she went missing. Yes. But yeah, he had defensive wounds, potential defensive wounds on his arms. And the police were like, meh. They didn't push the issue. They didn't even question him. Like. They, they didn't do a formal questioning at all. Um, so after these two days, they conducted a bunch of searches, right? They searched Rachel's room as well, and they found her coat and purse still in her room. So if she ran away, why wouldn't she take her coat, right? Yeah. That that doesn't make any fucking sense. That's not really- That's really scary though. Cause, okay. So right now we know she couldn't possibly have run away. If she's just got that one coat, she wouldn't, it makes no sense that she would go outside without right? it. Right. So she's still in the house somewhere? And also, last time she ran away, um, she left a note, right? She didn't leave a note this time. So, and she left her coat. She w- she was prepared the first time she ran away, right? So if she's running away this time, she didn't do anything like she did last time. And it's only been like around a year since she ran away the first time. So I don't think she ran away. I would want to know if the neighbors saw Vincent... Vincent's car going anywhere that day between 1045 and 3. Because if she's not on the property and she's somewhere and she's missing and her coat is still at the house, then she had to have gotten into a car. Yeah. Okay. But he, sorry, but one more thing. He also made a point to go out of his way to say that he left the door unlocked. Yes. While he was walking the dog, I think he's trying to draw attention away from himself. And he's trying to insinuate that possibly someone just waltzed in and kidnapped her. Yeah, in like less than a 30 minute window of time. Because he was only gone from the house for around 30 minutes. Okay. Sure, Vincent. Sure. Yeah. And it gets so much crazier. Okay. Just we're like at the tip of the iceberg of craziness right now. And it gets worse. So leaving your coat and purse is not really characteristic for someone who's running away in the freezing cold, right? They also found a few things in the days after Rachel went missing that they didn't publicly release until the year 2000, four years after. So they found these three things under Rachel's bed. Rachel's diary, a butcher knife, and a book called Daddy Kisses. Excuse me? Yeah. A butcher knife. A butcher knife. Under her bed? Yes. So they read Rachel's diary and Rachel wrote about how Vincent Mellon had been touching her inappropriately and attempting to kiss her. Rachel had not told anyone about the sexual abuse except for what she wrote in her diary. So the book Daddy Kisses is a children's book about daddy animals kissing their children. And I can't really find anything about who gave this book to her. But I'm going to take a leap and assume that Vincent gave Rachel this book as part of his attempt to groom her. And I'm also going to assume assume that the butcher knife under this poor girl's bed was placed there by her so she could protect herself from Vincent. This makes me so sad Mm -hmm. that she's 13. Like, and like when you're 13, like, what can you really do? You can run away, which is what she tried to do, right? Yeah. The fact that she ran away tells me that she didn't feel confident that her mom was going to do anything to protect her. Well, she was watching her mom get beaten by this man and then staying with him, right? Her mom was probably terrified of this man, and she recognized that. The people who were supposed to protect her were the ones who were harming her or looking the other way or getting harmed themselves. Exactly. So it's like, what was she supposed to do? She probably had little hope. She was trying to protect herself, clearly. (laughs) 
So unfortunately, Rachel's case pretty immediately went cold. But seemingly out of nowhere in the year 2000, so four years after Rachel went missing, police questioned Vincent for nine hours. So now they're questioning him. Four years later. They didn't do this at first. Why the hell not, though? I I literally don't know. There's the, a lot of the information on this case is super locked down. They they didn't release some things until like 2014. Like it's or 2009, I think. Um, is it just because they knew it would l- make themselves look bad? I think they dropped the ball and they're playing catch up. And also they realize that they dropped the ball and they don't want to fuck up their chance to prosecute Vincent. So they're trying to keep everything that they have super locked down so that they can compile evidence against him and hopefully do something about it, right? Because this shook the community pretty badly. It was a pretty tight-knit community. Lots of people knew Rachel and loved Rachel. In the year 2000, police questioned Vincent for nine hours. Then, after the questioning, immediately filed a warrant for Vincent Mellon's hair, semen, blood, and saliva samples, stating that they think Rachel was the victim of homicide. Police never publicly say what evidence prompted this. No footage or transcripts of this interview have ever been released. And I know you probably know how Hannah and I feel about polygraph tests. They're bunk science at best, right? But Vincent and Amy both took one. Amy passed hers and Vincent did not. We do know that Vincent was confronted about Rachel's diary entries, but he claims that he kissed her in an attempt to teach her about the dangers of predators and that it was purely educational. What? I swear to fucking God, I hate this bitch ass man so fucking much. I, I hate him. And Jeff Skemp, Rachel's biological father, feels the same way. He's quoted here saying, I think that if the police searched their garage the night they first got called there, especially knowing how many times they've been called to that house, if they searched the garage and opened up the trunk of the car that didn't run, I bet they find her right then and there. We don't have a ton of information about what Rachel wrote in her diary, and I don't even think that Vincent and Amy know. Is it possible that Vincent got Rachel pregnant? And that's why he had to kill her. Because you can't really talk your way out of that one. You can't really manipulate your wife out of that one. Like, and she's a 13 year old girl, like heads would be turned because that's, that's young, right? So it's, is it possible that Vincent got her pregnant and freaked out and wanted to get rid of her, right? I also wonder if, because the day before Rachel went missing, this is also a wild theory, uh, but- Rachel was crying by her locker saying she had a problem, right? So maybe she found out she was pregnant or maybe she was going to get revenge on Vincent. She put the knife there on purpose so that next time he came, she would kill him, right? Or she would fuck him up. So after questioning both Vincent and Amy, the Will County government in Illinois convened a grand jury because police revealed that they had made significant developments in the case through the use of technical advances. So this is in the year 2000, just to remind you four years after Rachel went missing. In case any of you are not sure what a grand jury is, I'll explain it. In contrast to a trial jury, which is asked to reach a verdict based on evidence presented during a civil or criminal trial, a grand jury meets in secret to consider whether there is sufficient evidence to justify a formal criminal charge against someone. That formal criminal charge is called an indictment. The reason police convened as a grand jury is because there was hearsay evidence that they wanted to use as part of a case against Vincent Mellon. The hearsay evidence was what Rachel wrote in her journal. In a formal criminal trial, it's possible that this evidence would not be admissible in court. It's actually highly likely that it wouldn't be admissible in court. And the reason this is is considered hearsay is because the evidence presented in court is susceptible to cross-examination and questioning. And since Rachel is missing and can't be questioned about what she wrote in her diary, presenting this as evidence is problematic for a defense because it's presented as indisputable fact. Whether or not the diary entry is true, and I personally believe that it absolutely is, is irrelevant to how the law perceives the diary entry, unfortunately. In the state of Illinois, hearsay evidence can be admissible in court through a few lawful exceptions, but it has to be approved by a judge. In the end, we have no idea if Rachel's diary was used in the grand jury trial, but my guess is that it wasn't allowed. I scoured the internet pretty well, and I cannot find public court documents about what happened in that grand jury, except that no indictments were made against Vincent or Amy. So Vincent walked away a free man from the grand jury trial. Jeff Skemp, Rachel's biological father, has been extremely active in his daughter's ongoing case and even moved back to Illinois from Dallas, Texas to help in any way that he can. This was devastating for Jeff to hear because he truly believes that Vincent is responsible for his daughter's disappearance. Okay, now we're getting to the point where I'm going to tell you about one of the detectives on Rachel's case. 
Okay. He was a man named Drew Peterson. Drew Peterson is a retired police sergeant from Bolingbrook, Illinois. And and this is kind of long-winded, but stay with me because it's it's relevant. This whole story is relevant. So this is a detective from the Bolingbrook Police Department. Yes, he's now retired. Okay. Uh, so Drew Peterson, after graduating high school and marrying his first wife, Peterson joined the army. After two years of service in the army, he joined the police department. After serving as a patrol officer, he was promoted to the drug unit, where he worked as an undercover officer. His first wife filed for divorce after learning that he was having an affair while he was on undercover duty. Peterson went on to marry his second wife, Victoria Connolly, who later discussed that Peterson was extremely abusive, physically and verbally, to both her and her daughter from a previous marriage. During his marriage to Connolly, Peterson was under investigation from the Bolingbrook Police Department for failing to report bribes and other misconduct while working undercover. He was temporarily fired, rehired, and then demoted. Peterson said that being under investigation put a lot of stress on his marriage, so naturally, it caused him to cheat on his second <laughs> wife. <laughs> so naturally, this pressure caused him to cheat on his second wife with Kathleen Savio, who would eventually become his third wife. I'm sorry. Okay, but... <laughs> yeah, let's recap this because it's, it's a lot. So Drew Peterson... Is he white? He sounds white. Yes. Drew Peterson is on his third wife after he... Cheated on his first wife while he was an undercover officer. While he was an undercover officer, he was taking bribes. The police found out about it. They fired him, but then rehired him, demoted him. And then he cheated because he was just so stressed out about people finding out about his bribes. Yeah, he has a really (laughs) rough life, Hannah. This poor man. I cannot imagine being him. How sad. How sad. (laughs) However many women it takes. (laughs) Good God! (laughs) Okay. Um, so yeah. Connolly and Peterson's divorce finalized in 1992, and Kathleen Savio and Peterson got married just two months after. Savio and Peterson were married for 10 years and shared a few children together, but their relationship was also filled with abuse. Savio languished in her relationship with Peterson, enduring physical abuse, control, manipulation, and infidelity until she filed for a protection order against him in 2002, and she was granted one. Peterson, who was 47 years old at the time, had been cheating on Savio with his future fourth wife, Stacey Kales. Oh, man. Who was 17 at the time they met and started dating. No! She was 17. She was a receptionist at... He is 47 years old? Yes. She's 17. Is that even legal? No. <laughs> it's not. Okay. <laughs> but he doesn't give a fuck. Ew. So, so Kathleen Savio filed for divorce. She separated from him and she was granted a protection order against Peterson. There were more than 18 domestic disturbances filed against Peterson between 2002 and 2004. So even after uh, Kathleen tried to separate herself from Peterson, he was still causing problems. He was still trying to hurt her. So they shared custody of their kids. And uh, in the last weekend in February, he was dropping his kids off back at Kathleen Savio's house. And it was a Sunday. So he had them for the weekend and he was dropping them off on a Sunday. But when he went to knock on the door, Savio didn't answer the door. He tried calling her, but she didn't answer the phone. So on Monday, the day after, the morning after, March 1st, Peterson went to the neighbors and asked them to go into the house with him to check on Savio. They discovered her lifeless body in the bathtub. The tub was empty, but her hair was damp, and she had a bloody gash on her head. The medical examiner ruled her death as accidental, but Savio's family were highly suspicious of Peterson because Savio endured years of abuse at his hands. Nothing was done, and Kathleen's death was not further investigated by police. Soon after, Stacy, the 17-year-old, so I think she's like 18 or 19 now, Stacy and Drew Peterson were married, but just like Peterson's three ex-wives before her, she discovered that Peterson was extremely abusive. In 2007, Stacy planned to help her sister with some painting, but Stacy never showed up. Stacy's sister filed a missing persons report on October 29, 2007. 
When Peterson was questioned by authorities, he claimed that Stacy had called him and told him she was leaving him for another man. Stacy's friends and family erupted to come to Stacy's defense. They were insistent that Stacy would never abandon her children, but Stacy has never been found to this day. Because of public outcry and the obvious suspicions surrounding Stacy's disappearance, police were strong armed into reopening the case of Kathleen Savio's mysterious accidental death. After Savio's body was exhumed and examined by a medical examiner not associated with the Bolingbrook Police Department, oh my God! The okay. medical examiner ruled that Savio's death was a homicide. The medical examiner said that Savio died by drowning. He also said that she had injuries to the front and back of her head, not consistent with an accidental death. She had hemorrhages in her chest muscles, indicating that she was forcibly drowned in the sink, toilet, or tub. In 2009, Peterson was indicted for the murder of Kathleen Savio. He was one of the detectives on Rachel's case. So this is like seven years after that this is kind of coming out? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. So... He killed Kathleen Savio in 2004, which is uh, eight years after Rachel died. So he was uh, he was probably married to his second wife or just married to his first wife or, or his third wife when he was on Rachel's case. He was like on the case back in 1996 or whenever it was revisited in 2000. In 1996. But he was still a sergeant in the police department in 2000 when they reopened the case. So you have an abusive man investigating the case of another abusive man. Who's a dirty cop. Who's a dirty cop that we know takes bribes. And there's obviously other people in the police department who are on the same page as Drew Peterson because the medical examiner signed off as Kathleen Savio's death was accidental when it clearly wasn't. Yeah, that the yeah, the medical examination was done by the Bolingbrook Police Department. Yes. So there's corruption within the police department, which is a red flag for lots of reasons. So there are a few reasons this information is relevant. I'll explain. Much of Drew Peterson's case for killing Kathleen Kathleen Savio was hearsay evidence. And as we discussed before, this type of evidence is rarely deemed admissible in court. The Illinois legislature was so hell-bent on getting this hearsay evidence in front of a jury to convict Drew Peterson that they passed Drew's law in 2008 that allows for exceptions for hearsay evidence to be heard in court. In September 2012, Peterson was convicted and sentenced to 38 years for the murder of Kathleen Savio because they were allowed to use that hearsay evidence. And in May 2016, he was sentenced again for an additional 40 years for trying to arrange a hit job on James Glasgow, the Will County State Attorney, a.k.a. the man who was trying to put him behind bars. He tried to put out a hit job? Yes! So he's not only a dirty cop that takes bribes- On the bribes, state attorney? Yes! He takes bribes. He There's corruption within the Bolingbrook Police Department because the medical examiner is in on it. At least there's probably other cops. He knows who to go to for a hit. Like that's not the kind of stuff that regular people just know how to do. That that means you're like deep into some shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, I, I want to, this is absolutely psychotic, but this is really relevant to Rachel's case because of Drew's law passed in 2008. So the police can use... Drew's law to bring in uh, Rachel's diary evidence into court to hopefully indict Vincent Mellon. But that, that hasn't happened yet. But that was the crazy shit that I found while I was putting the final touches on this episode. Like I was wrapping up the episode and then I randomly came across Drew Peterson and I was like, what in the entire fuck? So now I have more theories and questions, I guess. Do you think it's possible that Drew Peterson had something to do with Rachel Skemp's disappearance? Like, he was a dirty cop. He was doing this for almost 30 years. Um, he knew how to, like, who to reach out to to organize a hit. Like, he got away with murder. And it sounds like there are perp- multiple people within the department that helped him. And one of my gut reactions when I first heard this was, was Peterson participating in a trafficking ring? Is it possible that he knew or helped or or that was something that happened? This is pure speculation because this is, there's no evidence that points to this whatsoever. But it, it's one of my first gut reactions, I guess. I think if that were true, it would be very big. Um, But everybody knew how abusive and terrible this man was, but they just didn't care or they were just like him. And so they were happy to look the other way. Y'all, if he was one of my employees, as soon as I knew that he was dating a 17 year old, I would fire him. I I would have fired him long before that. He had a protective (laughs) order. But I mean, like if that was the only wrong thing he did. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. Right. (laughs) And that was like the least of the bad things that he did. Right. Oh my god. Like that and that's fucking saying something because that's horrendous. 
So Vincent Mellon has not stayed out of legal trouble since Rachel's disappearance. He's been jailed multiple times on domestic violence charges against Amy, but also his, at the time, 15-year-old son. While under the influence of alcohol, Vincent caused an accident while pulling out of a strip club parking lot. And because he never complied with the terms of his initial arrest, he currently has a warrant for his arrest in Will County, Illinois. All in all, he's been arrested on charges of theft, battery, drunken driving, and domestic battery. The Will County attorney hopes to open another grand jury case against Vincent once they get more evidence, especially because now that Drew's law was passed in 2008, Rachel's diary could now be used in court to indict Vincent. So wait, they don't know where he is? No, they do know where he is. Um, he he's moved around a lot. Um, but he's got a warrant out for his arrest. Yes, but it's it's How does not that work. I mean, if the warrant isn't on like murder or stuff, then it's it's just whatever. What do you mean? Like I could have a I could have a warrant out for me, and as long as it's not a big deal, they just let me walk around. Yeah. So let me get this straight. So if you have a warrant out for you, because I don't know how this works, essentially it's just on your record. So if you get pulled over for something else, technically they can take you in and then what, you sit in jail for a couple days? Yeah, they book you and you can post bail or uh, sit in jail for the allotted amount of time that you need to sit in jail for or that the law says you need to sit in jail for. Jeff Skemp said if his daughter were around today amid the pandemic, she would be on the front lines fighting against racial injustice, social injustice, police corruption, doing everything within her power to help those of us who are struggling and suffering. That makes me happy, he said. On May 25th, 2002, in commemoration of National Missing Children's Day, the city of Bolingbrook dedicated a tree to Rachel in a neighborhood park just steps away from the home where she disappeared, and a time capsule was filled with items from her friends and family who were there in attendance as part of a special ceremony. Rachel Marie Skemp has never been found, and her father tragically has accepted that she will not be coming home alive, but he still holds out hope that someone knows where she is or what happened to her. If you have any information about the disappearance of Rachel Marie Mellon Skemp, please contact the Bolingbrook Police Department at 630-226-8600. Have anything else to say before I sign off? The only thing that comes to mind is I wonder people who genuinely don't think that Vincent is the perpetrator, what are their theories? What do they think happened to her? There's such a short window of time when she went missing that it's it's kind of crazy to think about. Somebody would have had to been stalking her or uh Mm -hmm. and it just doesn't make sense but we just don't have a lot of information so i guess it's not impossible it's possible that something crazy like that happened but i think it's more likely that the person who was sexually abusing her killed her yeah the person who had a motive and opportunity yeah which is vincent mellon yes thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of crime suit podcast be sure to find us on social media and let us know your thoughts on this case you can find us on TikTok at Crime Soup Podcast and on Instagram and Twitter at Crime underscore Soup. We also have a website, CrimeSoupPodcast.com, where you can listen to all of our episodes and buy your very own Crime Soup merch. As always, we'll see you next Tuesday. Stay safe and bon appetit.